He said to Mick Fleetwood that he was topping out to buy a magazine and he literally didn't come back. <laughs> and they eventually discovered that he'd come across the Children of God, that sort of 70s cult. Somebody invited him into the Children of God headquarters and he just stayed there. He just said, that this is it, this is it for me. And, I, and he literally wouldn't come out. This is the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone with Richard Serrett. Heard exclusively on the Jericho Network in partnership with Westwood One. Unearthing the biggest stories from the history of rock. Exposing the truth and the tragedy. The stories behind rock's immortals. The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. What might happen is that we blow your mind. Here's your host, Richard Serrett. In 1967, three former members of the English blues band John Mayall and the Blues Breakers formed a new outfit. The leader of this new blues project was Peter Green, a major figure in what is now referred to as the second great epoch of the British blues movement. None other than B.B. King once commented of Green, he has the sweetest tone I ever heard. Noted for his string bending and vibrato, guitar legends Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page have both praised Green's guitar style. When it came time to name the new group, Green, who shunned the limelight, chose to leave his name out of it. Instead, he combined the last names of his drummer, Mick Fleetwood, and the nickname for his bass player, John McVie, and Fleetwood Mac was born. That same year, Peter Green was adamant that the band recruit a second guitarist to fill out the band's sound. In the summer of 1967, accomplished slide guitarist and pianist Jeremy Spencer caught Green's attention. Spencer was invited into the group, and the trio was now a quartet. Soon after, another young guitarist, Danny Kerwin, was added, along with McVie's new bride, Christine McVie, adding yet another singer-songwriter to the lineup. This first incarnation of Fleetwood Mac is often referred to as the Peter Green era. But it wasn't to last. By the early 70s, Green, Spencer, and Kerwin would all depart, only to be replaced with two more guitarists, Bob Welsh and Bob Weston. They, in turn, would depart in 1974, paving the way for yet another incarnation of Fleetwood Mac, the Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks era, during which the band enjoyed its greatest success. Their 1975 self-titled album, finally established Fleetwood Mac as superstars in North America. Their follow-up album, Rumors, featured a pop rock and soft rock sound and produced the singles Don't Stop, Go Your Own Way, You Make Loving Fun, and Dreams. The album won the Grammy for Album of the Year and to date has sold more than 40 million copies. The saga of the recording of Rumors would go down as one of the great soap operas in rock history. The lengthy and expensive recording sessions were marked by legendary excess. The band and their entourage partied all day, consumed copious amounts of cocaine, and when they were so whacked out they couldn't do anything, they started recording. And then there were the incredible strains within the group, John and Christine McVie had divorced and found it difficult to be in the same room with one another. Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks also had an acrimonious parting of the ways. Mick Fleetwood had also split with his wife, model Jenny Boyd, for the second time. But somehow, the band put aside their personal differences and managed to push through the drama to produce one of the greatest albums of the 1970s. Few bands in the annals of rock history have experienced more drama. Few bands would have survived. Few bands have undergone more personnel changes over their 50 plus years, including more than a dozen different guitarists. On this episode of the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, we're focusing on the departure of several guitarists which ultimately had tragic endings. Was Lindsey Buckingham 
the longest serving Fleetwood Mac guitarist onto something when he quipped, there might be a curse on Fleetwood Mac guitarists. You can decide for yourself when the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone continues. Welcome back to the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. Here's Richard Serrett. Lindsey Buckingham, the longest serving guitarist in the band, may have been just kidding around when he wondered aloud if there might be some kind of curse on the guitarists in Fleetwood Mac. He may have been commenting on his own circumstances within the group since he was fired on two separate occasions. But upon closer examination, there may be something to this legend. The long line of guitarists who left the band often under strange or tragic circumstances, begins with Fleetwood Mac's founder, Peter Green. Richard Unterberger is the author of Fleetwood Mac, The Complete Illustrated History. Green had a very distinctive tone. As I wrote in my book, it even got admiration from B.B. King, so it wasn't just from rock musicians, B.B. King being one of the top bluesmen of all time. Peter Green, more than any other guitarist, I'm not just talking blues, rock, but any electric guitarist, was a master of the sustain, meaning a note that you hold for a few seconds or more, and you can waver it, change the pitch, and things like that. And he had a very distinctive kind of icy tone that was very penetrating. He had a great technique, and he was part of that small group of English guitar players, obviously Clapton being the most prominent, who had phenomenal techniques as well as understanding the sort of subtleties and the simplicity of playing the blues, but with this amazing technique. And he became a guitarist, guitarist almost immediately. Almost immediately his face appeared on the scene. But, but obviously he was a fantastic player when you hear him, and, and he got to the roots of that particular sort of genre, which he kept in its sort of simplest form, or its purest form. He was also just a very fluid blues player, and he modified his guitar so he had a sound that could not be easily imitated. I think he's also, however, a very underrated songwriter and singer. He had a very heartfelt voice as not just a singer, but a composer, where, like his guitar, you knew it was him, and it was extremely personal. Now, sometimes, like the blues is, sometimes it was joyous. Maybe he gets more attention for the songs he wrote, which have an element of despair or despondency, like Man of the World or Green Monolishi or Oh Well. And I think his best songs are a good example of how the best white British blues guys could create blues with some rock influence, just as heartfelt and sincere as the African Americans who were their inspiration, because you felt that what he was singing about came for very much from personal experience. Well, with the formation of the band, I think Peter Green was quite an unusual figure insofar as I didn't even include his own name in the name of the band, but incorporated two of the band members' names. Obviously, from the word go, he was a purist in terms of his playing. He was frustrated whenever the band went into what he perceived as a sort of commercial direction, a populist direction, call it what you like. And he was quite happy to dig that furrow of, of pure blues that was very fashionable at the time, in the late 60s, while ignoring the sort of fruits of success, really, which presumably led to his estrangement with the band. If you read accounts of Peter Green during Fleetwood Mac's early years and you read quotes from interviews, and there were quite a few that he gave in the British press, he seems in like the first couple years or so where he was pretty much the leader of Fleetwood Mac, very confident, very assured, and very stable. It seems that the mental difficulties that he's struggled with since then really started to arise maybe the second half of 1969, when they were one of the biggest groups in Britain and Europe. They were not in the United States yet. That would be quite a ways off. And it seems that he had very mixed feelings about success, feeling that the especially material rewards he got, they weren't very satisfying. 
And he also felt that almost uniquely among rock stars that he shouldn't be getting all of this money for doing music, something that he wanted to do anyway. And he started to say in the press and to other members of the band, I want to give my money away. I want to give it to charitable causes. We should be doing not just more benefit concerts, which they had already done, but um, mostly or solely benefit concerts. He had very curious notions about not just music, but about life in general. And one of his big evangelical views that he tried to impose on the band was the fact that they should, if they were making a lot of money, they should give it all away or, or most of it. And of course, Mick Fleet would, uh, would have none of that. And <laughs> so would the rest of the band, I suspect. But he sort of made it an issue time and time again. And by the late 60s, he, he'd become a thorn in their side. It was something like with Sid Barrett of Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett, the original leader of Pink Floyd, that was not apparently present at all when the group rose to fame. It really surfaced shortly after that when they had some hit records. Sometimes associates of Fleetwood Mac have felt that when Peter Green visited a commune in Munich in early 1970, when they were touring in Germany, the experiences he had there, including taking acid, were partly or maybe even chiefly responsible for sparking the mental problems he had and the problems he had coping with being a top musician. Everybody flirted with drugs in those days, obviously, and I think it was on their trip to Munich, which was, I think, in 68, when he got involved with a, a hippie commune in, in Munich and notoriously had a bad LSD trip and never really came out of it. That was the actual crucial catalyst of him starting to have mental breakdowns. My feeling is that those problems are deep enough that they were probably already there, and maybe this experience helped trigger or accelerate this, but I don't think it could have been solely responsible and it wasn't an incident where like he took acid and he rescued him and he was a zombie and he never got out of that he actually continued with the group for a couple months or so including even doing some recording and tv appearances but he had already told the group i think i'm leaving then he made it definite i'm leaving and by the end of the spring he was out later on he was a uh diagnosed as schizophrenic. And of course, he, over the years, he's appeared on the, in the English scene in various states of health and states of presentation, but he didn't sort of, it didn't completely destroy him, put it that way, but, but it certainly destroyed his, his most creative period and particularly his functioning with Fleetwood Mac. That's Mike Evans, author of Fleetwood Mac, The Definitive History. In the summer of 1967, 21-year-old Jeremy Cedric Spencer, an accomplished guitarist in his own right, was performing with a blues trio called the Levy Set when he caught Peter Green's attention and was invited to join Fleetwood Mac. He would be the next guitarist in the band to fall under the supposed curse. Once again, Richie Unterberger. He was the most entertaining member of the group in concert. He was chiefly responsible for whatever sense of humor they had in those early days, not just when he did his blues songs, which were either Elmar James covers or very derivative of Elmar James, a guy who's famous for the riff from Dust My Blues, but also he did a lot of rock and roll parodies and he would clown around on stage. So even though when you listen to the records, that's not the most important aspect of their music, it gave the group a balance, especially in concert, that really increased their appeal. And he was very beloved by audiences for that. Jeremy Spencer, the other guitarist, was similarly a blues purist, maybe not quite as radically a purist as Peter Green. He was part of that early phase of the band when they were reaching out and doing interesting things outside the, the strict format of the blues. Jeremy Spencer, of course, also used to indulge himself quite amusingly in pastiches of rock and roll singers, Elvis and things like that as part of the stage act. So he sort of took the, the music into a slightly more, if you like, showbiz, using that in the broadest sense of the word, a sort of showbiz environment in as much as he was quite happy to indulge himself in things that were crowd pleasers. And then, of course, the band got to the stage where they made Albatross, which was, a, for them, a radical step into its strictly commercial world. Peter Green would have none of that. He was already sort of stuck his feet into the original standpoint. Spencer was, as I say, he was willing to broaden his view and the sort of genre of the band more than Peter Green, but, but he too was such a blues disciple and, and again, such a great 
technician that he star turns on stage apart from his amusing impersonations were his Elmo James inspired runs on with my broom and those kind of riff blues riff things which were by the late 60s were already hackneyed but in the hands of somebody like Jeremy Spencer they still seem very fresh every time he played them and as is now pretty well known among Fleetwood Mac fans he left Fleetwood Mac not too long after Peter Green in the early 70s also in kind of controversial circumstances where they were on tour in the United States and in the middle of the tour he joined what most people would call a religious cult the Children of God and he left the group Jeremy Spencer he'd always been religious he and his wife apparently when the band were on the road he and his wife would be reading the Bible while the rest of the band were reading pop magazines or whatever and he was again by 1971 he was, he was equally frustrated as uh, as Peter Green had been that the band were getting increasingly away from the blues and into a more what he perceived as sort of commercial pop and again this came to a head in one particular instant in this case they were in Los Angeles and he said to Mick Fleetwood or whoever that uh, he was popping out to buy a magazine and he literally didn't come back <laughs> and they eventually discovered that he'd gone outside down, down the road strolled down the boulevard come across the children of God that sort of late 60s early 70s cult somebody invited him into the children of God headquarters or whatever it was and and started persuading him if you like and he just stayed there he just said that this is it this is it for me and, and he literally wouldn't come out and it took them days to find him but this is how it transpired and he joined the children of God and I there to cancel the tour he turned his back on the band and on music generally for many years and they had to carry on without him on an emergency basis until they found a permanent replacement. Danny Kerwin was only a teenager when he joined the band in 1968, but his talent was apparent to the band's guitarists, Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer, bassist John McVie, and drummer Mick Fleetwood. He played on five albums beginning with Then Play On a bluesy 1969 record on which he shared writing and lead guitarist duties with Green. He wrote half of the tracks on the band's 1972 album, Bare Trees. During four years with the band, Kerwin composed thoughtful instrumentals and performed inventive harmonies, playing on tracks such as Oh Well and Man of the World. On stage, he was known for his vibrato, he too would exit the band under inauspicious circumstances, and his life would also take a tragic turn. Once again, the author of Fleetwood Mac, The Definitive History, Mike Evans. Danny Kerwin was the third guitarist at one stage with Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer when they felt that there was a need. The often Green or Spencer, particularly Green, would only appear on certain tracks and things on albums, so that there was often not the complete band appearing on particular songs. So they, they felt there was a need for a, a third guitarist, and Danny Kerwin was the man. The decision to put Danny Kerwin in the lineup to expand it from a quartet to a quintet, that predated Peter Green's, not just his decision to leave Fleetwood Mac, but it even predated his internal conflicts about whether he should be in the group. It was around late summer of 1968 that Danny Kerwin joined and Peter Green didn't leave Fleetwood Mac for a year and a half. The reason they got Danny Kerwin in the group, I think it was mostly that they were very impressed by his talents, although he was still like in his late teens, when they saw him play on the British circuit with his previous group. And they were thinking of helping him, of helping his group, but then they were realizing this guy is a much better guitarist, certainly, but even singer and songwriter than the rest of the group. And because in our group, we could use some more original material, certainly, and another talented guitarist, because Jeremy Spencer's abilities were good but fairly limited to Elmer James style blues playing, we can put him in the group. We'll add another singer and songwriter, not just another guitarist. And for the short period where he and Green were in the group, it worked very well, not just on their studio recordings, but fortunately, many years later, quite a few live recordings and good quality emerged that were legitimately released where you can hear that they integrated him into the lineup very well. It's too bad that didn't last longer. I mean, really, the only studio album where you hear Green and Kerwin as full contributors to the group is then Play On, which I think is their best record. He, like many people at the time, overindulged in substances. 
he had some violent arguments with Bob Welch, who, who was the other guitarist that came in, filling the boots of Jeremy Spencer. The next two guitarists were Kerwin and Bob Welch for a while. And Bob Welch and Kerwin had some violent arguments, one of which Kerwin smashed his guitar and so on, and, and had to be sacked from the band. He was just having more and more problems getting along with the rest of the group, and not just on a personal level, but on a musical level. And it was in keeping with their constant history of tumult that would go on for years after um, these three guitarists had left the group. But with the introduction of first Christine McVie and then later on some other members, including Bob Welch, into the group, their style was constantly changing. And also the interpersonal dynamics were less stable than they were in most other top British groups. And it seems like he was just getting harder to get along with and maybe had ego problems, which are not unique to him or Cleveland Mac, of course. And they decided they couldn't work with him anymore. Now, as was the case with Peter Green, what's a little surprising and certainly disappointing is he was still young when he left the group. He was in his early 20s. And although I don't think he was as talented as Peter Green, certainly the best songs that he sang and played guitar with and wrote on Fleetwood Mac were pretty good. His solo career didn't have many highlights like that. And it's hard to say why did he deteriorate musically, but also personally. Not as uh, famously as Peter Green, he had mental problems which led to him being homeless or having a hard time even supporting himself. He ended up a vagrant, a homeless person in London. He, of course, died quite recently in 2018. It's hard to say what triggered that. There wasn't an incident like, oh, he took some LSD or he declared in the papers, you know, um, I found a religious sect or I don't want anything to do with show business. But he, like Peter Green, seemed to pretty quickly descend into mental illness, which he never fully escaped from. Robert Lawrence Welch Jr. was born in Los Angeles in August of 1945 into a show business family. His father was a movie producer and screenwriter who worked at Paramount Pictures in the 40s and 50s, producing films starring top box office stars Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Bob Jr. had struggled with a variety of marginal bands until 1971 when he was invited to join Fleetwood Mac. They had just recently lost two of their three frontline members, Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer. Bob Weston was born in 1947 in Plymouth, England, to a Royal Navy service family. Fleetwood Mac took notice of Weston after seeing him perform with Long John Baldry. Weston joined in 72 after the departure of Danny Kerwin. However, neither Welch nor Weston would last long. Bob Welch, when he joined, he brought an even more decidedly less blues-oriented approach to the group because that was more of his background, but also because he was American, although he had been living in Europe for quite some time, he brought a more American sensibility to the group. This mixture of British and American sensibilities would, of course, really blossom commercially when Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks joined in the mid-70s, but it was there to a degree when Bob Welch joined, where part of the reason that Fleetwood Mac by the mid-70s, even before Buckingham and Nicks joined, were more popular in the States than the UK, I think was because of Bob Welch's presence. I think, to be honest, Bob Weston's membership in the group, which wasn't very long, I don't think it meant much that way or the other. They needed other members there to fill out the sound, but as a composer um, and somebody who helped shape their vision, he was much less important than Bob Welch or Christine McVie during the times that the era that when he was in the group. Bob Welch and Bob Weston were in the band around the same time. Welsh from 71 and Weston from 72, uh, both for a couple of years. They had a sort of rocky relationship with the rest of the band. But Bob Welsh never got over the fact that when he left the band, and in later years, all the major players in the band were recognised in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and he was actually conspicuously left out. So even members who'd left under a cloud, if you like, were acknowledged in the Hall of Fame. And Welsh, for reasons best known to the rest of the band, was, was actually omitted. Bob Welch left Fleetwood Mac towards the end of 1974 due to a culmination of factors, none of which is that easy to pinpoint. 
But I think it was frustrating to him and to other members of the group, but maybe more to him, that they had been recording and releasing records pretty often for a few years and getting some critical acclaim, but not really becoming stars or making a lot of money. And I think this kind of strange legal problems that they had around 1973 and 1974, where there was a bogus Fleetwood Mac that their former manager was trying to tour when Fleetwood Mac were kind of taking a break from touring and they had to drag it through the courts. I think that took a lot out of Bob Welch, but also out of the rest of the group. And maybe Bob Welch was thinking, I've put a lot into this group and not only apparently are we not making much or any headway besides being kind of a mid-level group who will sell maybe 100,000 records at most and be second or third in the bill. But also, on top of that, it's just hard to even continue because we have problems legally retaining our name, which they eventually won. Also, other members of Fleetwood Mac who were British were trying to move to the States, and that's in kind of an involved process that was very complicated. I think it just burned him out. I don't think he was especially having problems getting along musically or personally with the rest of the group, but he felt that it was time to move on. He had mental problems as well and committed suicide in 2012. So again, it was a sort of tragic end to his career. Bob Welch's sad death, I think, was more accelerated by his physical difficulties than his material circumstances or his musical success. He, he wasn't having much toward the end of his life, but he was in a lot of pain due to his various illnesses, and I think that's the reason that he committed suicide. Bob Weston's departure was, well, he died in 2012 as well, but his departure was, if you like, a bit more colorful and domestic. He started having an affair with Jenny Boyd, who is, of course, Mick Fleetwood's wife, Patty Boyd's sister, and uh, he would start having an affair with her. So even though Bob Weston was a big friend of Mick Fleetwood, but once that happened, of course, Mick Fleetwood had him out of the band. Understandably, I think, Mick Fleetwood felt that it was difficult to continue to perform and record with this guy in his group. And I think Bob Weston being a kind of average talent, to be honest, made this easier because, you know, just a few years later, you'd have a few situations in the group where romantic relationships within the band were breaking up. And I'm sure all of them, all five of them, as it turned out, everyone in the group was finding it difficult to be around other members of the group in any situation but because they had so much talent and they worked together so well musically they made an extraordinary effort to keep it together to do recording and perform and to build their superstardom with bob weston the stakes weren't that high losing bob weston was not like losing peter green or even danny kerwin or jeremy spencer or bob welsh he wasn't as important or distinctive to the character of the group so it was easy for mick fleetwood to make that decision and why could he make that decision after peter green left the group, even though Mick Fleetwood did not write or sing material for Fleetwood Mac, unusually for a drummer, he was the leader of the group, both in terms of their business, certainly, but also even their creative direction, even if that was more like assembling talent and working with talent rather than writing the material. Sadly, both Welch and Weston passed away in 2012. Weston died of cirrhosis. Welch had recently learned he would never walk again after undergoing back surgery. After writing his wife a nine-page love letter explaining how he did not wish to be a burden to her, he shot himself in the chest. When the rock and roll Twilight Zone continues, the curse of the Fleetwood Mac guitarist continues. Top Big Dad. What a gas. Totally ape. Sorry, I was tripping on hippie culture. Getting all groovy on your ass. It happens. Welcome back to the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. Here's Richard Sue. On this episode of the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, we're exploring the legend of the curse of the Fleetwood Mac guitarists. The departure of Bob Welch and the firing of Bob Weston in 1974 left a huge vacancy in the band. And with a tour looming on the horizon, Mick Fleetwood had to find a replacement, and fast. 
it was good luck in a sense, but also a testament to Mick Fleetwood's ability to spot talent and to organize talent and to take advantage of an opportunity. So Fleetwood Mac had moved to the United States because they were more popular there than they were in the United Kingdom, although they weren't real stars here yet. Bob Welch left unexpectedly. And Fleetwood Mac had obligations to meet, to, you know, generate money to support themselves. But also they were planning a new record. They thought, you know, Bob Welch was going to be along with Christine McVie, the main composer. And suddenly they're without a lead guitarist and one of their main singers and songwriters. And Mick Fleetwood was already looking around Los Angeles, which is where they had re- relocated to, for studios to record. And one of the studios he checked out was Sound City. And Sound City was a place where the producer, Keith Olsen, was working with a then little-known duo, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. And Mick Fleetwood was just checking the studio out. He didn't know who Buckingham and Nicks were. This was around late 74. And Keith Olsen, just to kind of demonstrate the kind of music that they had recently recorded at Sound City, played him some material by Buckingham and Nicks. And Fleetwood liked what he heard. And when he realized this is the very end of 1974, we pretty quickly have to find a replacer for Bob Welch. He remembered that tape he'd heard and he had Keith Olsen relay the message or put him in touch with Lindsey Buckingham saying you know are you interested in joining Fleetwood Mac Lindsey Buckingham made it clear well I have this duo career going with my then girlfriend Stevie Nicks and if we give that up which we don't really want to do but you know there's some pluses to joining a name group Fleetwood Mac she has to be part of the deal too Lindsay Buckingham was cutting some sides with Stevie Nicks, I think, in the next studio to somewhere where they were working. And they were looking for a new guitarist. And I think it was Mick Fleetwood approached him, and he and Stevie Nicks were already a double act. And he said, well, he'd only be interested in joining if, if Stevie Nicks was included in the deal. And they were looking for a new sound, a new whatever. So Stevie Nicks being involved was the option, rather than losing the opportunity to get Buckingham in. So in a way, Stevie came in by default. But in in fact, obviously, that contributed to what became the kind of classic Mac lineup of the 70s. And to his credit, although Mick Fleetwood hadn't been thinking of the, along those lines, I think it helped that Stevie Nicks was also a singer and songwriter. He was like, OK, let's see if that works. And they got along musically and personally initially when they got together and it was decided, yeah, this will be the new Fleetwood Mac, two American Californian singer songwriters in the group. And they really had no idea how well it would work. If you compare it to Buckingham Nick's songs on their one album they did together right before Fleetwood Mac to what they wrote for the first album where they were part of Fleetwood Mac, the songs on which they're featured on that 1975 album have a much stronger pop appeal than the ones that they had done with Buckingham Nicks, but it did work out that suddenly they had three commercial singer-songwriters within the same group, and that made the self-titled album they did in 1975 by far a bigger seller than anything they had done before. Of course, by this time, their sound had changed a lot in just five or six years, and it wasn't much like what they had sounded like with Peter Green. The band wanted to expand on the commercial success of their self-titled 1975 album, but they struggled with relationship breakups before the recording started. The Rumors Studio Sessions, which began in February of 1976, were marked by hedonistic behavior and interpersonal strife among band members. But in spite of everything, the album would mark the band's pinnacle of artistic achievement and commercial success. It was phenomenal sales figures, and it just it, it just kept on selling. I mean, there are a lot of the tracks there which became classic in their own right. You know, second-hand news, I didn't want to know, you'd be loving fun. There were all sorts of songs that were just don't stop, which is probably, the, the, in a way, the, the archetypal feat with Max song of that period. They became classics and, and hit singles. Was, I don't know how many hit singles were taken off the uh, album, uh, probably about three or four at least, which is a lot for one album. It's, it's all by the cartload for... Well, for months and, and in fact years, and it was one of the sort of breakthroughs of the kind of soft rock genre of the, of the late 70s. It, it came to typify sort of soft rock or mainstream rock. When Rumors was recorded, Fleetwood Mac were now big stars because of the success of the self-titled 1975 album, the first one that they had done with Buckingham and Nicks. But... 
there were problems that were threatening not just their commercial viability, but the very existence of the group. And it's pretty well known. It was even well known by the late 1970s that Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks were breaking up around the time that they started to record rumors, but also that John McVie and Christine McVie, who had married back in the late 1960s, were also breaking up. Christy McVie had an affair with the Lighting Man, and there were various other contributing relationships around the band that made those songs in rumors a catalog of the various personal hang-ups and angsts that were swirling around the band in the studio. They, you know, they, they were autobiographical, really. It wasn't, you know, songs like Go Your Own Way and Never Go In Again, Second Hand News. They were autobiographical. They, they related to various things going on within the band and their entourage. There was a famous cover of Rolling Stone, which implied that there were various interband relationships, if you like, which weren't exactly spelled out on the cover, but it was a kind of cover of them all lying in bed together. True Life Confessions, they called the article. At the same time, although this maybe wasn't as serious, Mick Fleetwood was breaking up with his wife. So all of them were having these explosive breakups, especially the two pairs within the group. And it's a tribute to their professionalism that I think most groups would have broken up in this situation. They would have been like, I can't be around my ex-partner now. I just can't even stand to be in the same room with them sometimes, let alone collaborating very closely on new songs and new recordings. But A, it's a tribute to their professionalism that they, I don't think they had a meeting where they decided this formally, but they decided we're going to stay together as a group because musically we work together too well. But B, also, as is well known, we can use these personal experiences we're going through for inspiration for some of our new material. It wasn't so blatant that there were songs where Christy McVie wrote saying this is why I'm breaking up with John McVie or these are some really painful things we've going through. They're more allusion to what's going on, but they're there especially if you know the background. And the same thing with Buckingham and Nick's Go Your Own Way is a pretty famous example. And they made this tension in a way work for them, both in terms of the songwriting, but also the process of developing the record, which as a studio recording is still one of the highest selling albums of all time. The tensions between them as people also carried over to some degree to what they were doing in the studio, because Rumors were recorded at a few different studios and they did a lot of re-recording, they had some fights over what songs to include, but compromising this vision with very five strong-minded people maybe led to something that was stronger than the sum of the parts that they couldn't have created with any other combination. The fact that Rumors was even completed is a remarkable achievement all on its own, considering the massive amount of drug taking that occurred. Mike Evans details the excessive use of cocaine during this period and afterwards. The amount of cocaine that they were supposed to have taken was legendary. And when they had recording sessions, the, the recording sessions dragged on for weeks and months, not because they were always being particularly perfectionist, but because they they simply couldn't get it together in any normal sort of time frame. And then there were these legendary stories about mountains of cocaine and Nick Fleetwood saying that he'd spent, I don't know how many million dollars on it during his career and Stevie Nicks having damaged the actual interior of a nose through sniffing the stuff and so that this was sort of part of their anarchic kind of lifestyle and and again because it was part of sort of the Fleetwood Mac industry if you like with all their entourage as well that it persisted probably longer than it would have done with a bunch of man in the street sort of people when the rock and roll twilight zone continues the curse of the Fleetwood Mac guitarist claims one more victim our movie night at the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. We all get into my Pinto and head over to Richard's. Actually, that's not totally true. Sometimes we take my gremlin. This week, it's the film noir classic, Reefer Madness. <laughs> I love that scene. Hey, this one's good, too. It's the screenplay I like. Welcome back to the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. Here's Richard Serrett. (laughs) 
As the 80s wore on and the excesses continued, the band struggled and failed to repeat the success of Rumors. And even Lindsey Buckingham, who had managed to survive a dozen years with the band, was not immune from the curse. Lindsey Buckingham left the group and or was fired in the late 1980s. And it seems like the main problems, well, again, as with other explosive conflicts within the group it's hard to say well there's this one or even just this two they were having harder problems getting along with him personally it had to do with egos not just on buckingham's part but on the whole band's part i think it's fair to say but also there were they were having a harder time compromising or coalescing on their musical direction i mean this even predates back to tusk in a way where lindsey buckingham did not want to repeat what they had been so successful with with rumors and when he wanted to do something edgier, more adventurous, and they were able to work out for Tusk a way to do that, where especially on the things that he wrote, they did some stuff that people were not expecting on the other tracks that Nixon McVie wrote. That was less so, but they found a way to complete that record at great expense. It was becoming harder to do that. It was becoming harder to find common ground. And it was also becoming harder to repeat that mega commercial success that they had in the 1970s. They were under a lot of pressure from their record company, I would think, but also some self-imposed pressure. How can we maintain these peaks that we have with our best-selling records? And there were arguments, disputes over how to do that, what the best thing was. And that led to Buckingham's departure. There was a lot of friction between him and Stevie Nicks. Of course, they were partners when they joined the band. But I think by then, there was a lot of friction going on in the band with him and, and the other members, both in terms of relationships and musical to a degree. I think they felt that Buckingham was, there was a feeling with the rest of the band, the long-standing members, if you like, Fleetwood and McVie and Christine McVie, that he'd become not the star of the band, but he'd become something of a figurehead for a section of their audience. Uh, and he and Stevie Nicks, of course, came out of a rather more glamorous West Coast pop kind of environment. And I think for a lot of American audiences, it identified more with Buckingham's kind of image than these long-standing English rockers, you know. <laughs> And then pretty recently, just in the past year, Buckingham left and or been fired again. I think it's hard to say exactly did he quit or was he fired because there were motivations on both parts, on Buckingham's parts and the other people in the band to be want to continue as a quintet. I have to say that as far as the very recent departure from the group, except for people who follow them very, very closely and just want to see every time that they perform, it's almost like, is this a, even a big deal anymore? It's like an elephant in the room. Fleetwood Mac have not done a full album of original material for many years. It's not like in the middle of recording an album, one of the main songwriters leaves. That's a very big problem if you're trying to create a major statement, a major artistic statement. But not only was it not in the middle, as far as we know, of a major project like that, they haven't been able to complete a major original project like that for many years and maybe will never do so. So it's kind of an anticlimactic departure or major loss because what are we losing? Maybe nothing as far as a new record. After the most recent firing of Lindsey Buckingham, Mick Fleetwood recruited two more guitarists into his fold. New Zealand singer-songwriter musician Neil Finn, formerly of Crowded House, and Mike Campbell, ex of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. We wish them a long and healthy run with their new band. However, the question must be asked, is there really a curse? Mike Evans. He called it a guitarist curse in Fleetwood Mac. It probably says something about Fleetwood Mac as an environment to work in because I guess, you know, John McVie and Mick Fleetwood were not necessarily the easiest guys to get on with musically. And of course, initially, the guitarists, both of the original blues heroes, if you like, Green and Spencer, were the ambition of Mick Fleetwood and John McVie was to make the band commercially as successful as they could. And it wasn't particularly a musical ambition, it was a commercial ambition as well. So that was the first tension. Later tensions were more personal with Bob Weston and Bob Welsh, I guess, and Danny Kerman with his very bad relationship with Welsh. So they were kind of more personal tensions. I think the first tensions were artistic. And just when they got to that huge, huge success, just the general life on the road, I don't know if it's a guitarist curse, but it just happened to come out in the fates of those particular guitars that we've talked about. 
when Lindsey Buckingham states that there is a curse on the guitarist in Fleetwood Mac, I think there is some truth in that, but also it's not wholly true. Certainly the three guitarists who were in, I think, their best lineup in the late 60s, Peter Green, Jeremy Spencer, and Danny Kerwin, they all left under cloudy and unexpected circumstances. And for Green and Kerwin, certainly, they had very troubled lives after they left Fleetwood Mac. Not so much Jeremy Spencer, although most people would say you've joined what is considered a religious cult. So that's, you know, a tragedy. He, I think there's an important distinction. He doesn't see it as a tragedy. It's just something that he did, which was unexpected and most people don't understand, but he's continued to lead a very sane life in apparently most or all respects. And Bob Welch's tragedy where he committed suicide, that did not occur until decades after he left Leewood back. And also he had a lot of success as a solo artist, for at least for a few years, shortly after leaving Fleetwood back. So that wasn't wholly tragic in his circumstance. It's not like something such as the drummers from Spinal Tap. I know they're a fictional group, but you know, it's a funny part of the Spinal Tap movie where they go through whatever 57 drummers maybe it's not 57 maybe it's more like seven or ten and they all die you know in these weird accidents it's not something as blatant as that and with buckingham's particular circumstance if he's saying the curse has continued with him because he's left the group under unsavory circumstances twice i would say it's overstating it to say that there's a tragedy or curse involved in many ways he had a very blessed life he was in a duo that was not having commercial success and by chance he was offered the opportunity to join fleetwood mac which he took full advantage of you have to give him a lot of credit he pulled full weight as a singer and songwriter a very big part of their successful years but he was a superstar with Fleetwood Mac for quite a few years he had a very long run with them it might have been frustrating to him that twice he kind of goes out of the band under conditions that aren't to his liking but I think his fortune with the group far outweighs his misfortune with them Curse or no curse, Fleetwood Mac keeps rolling along with just two original members, Mick Fleetwood and John McVie. The band's sound today is almost unrecognizable from the Peter Green era when they were a blues band, and yet the band still remains. With all the personnel changes, all the tragedy, all the drama, the band still remains. One has to ask, why? How? I think the fact that there was this sort of peculiar dynamic in the band involving into relationship with Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham and Mick Fleetwood and so on, it would have destroyed most bands. It would have torn them apart very easily, but they seem to thrive on it, partly because it produced this dynamic kind of material. But also, I think that was just part of the dynamic, the, the social dynamic they had between us, which is, I suppose, unique, because most bands wouldn't have survived in those kind of circumstances. If you look at Fleetwood Mac's entire career, it's not so easy to say what keeps them going for, it's been half a century now, as it is for some other groups. Let's take the Rolling Stones, the most famous example of a long-lived group, maybe. Rolling Stones are coming up on 60 years pretty soon. Really, it's about 55 years right now. And they have, as their constants, the two main songwriters, the two main creative forces, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, who have tried solo projects, but realize they don't work separately as they do together. And there's a consistency to the Rolling Stones style, which is very roughly speaking, mixing elements of rock, blues, and pop that there is not with Fleetwood Mac. With Fleetwood Mac, I think the consistency has been, even though Mick Fleetwood has written or vocalized very little of their material, which has involved many, many albums at this point. He is the leader, has been since 1970. Even before that was very important as an organizer and on the business side. And it's more important to him than anything else in the world, including his marriages. I think he's alluded to that in his memoirs to play music, especially live, but also to keep creating music in the studio. They are a phenomenon, but they are a phenomenon that's changed unrecognizably from what they originally set out to be. I mean, the, the Rolling Stones are still basically a rhythm and blues band, and they've been going longer than Fleetwood Mac, and so in a way that, that they kind of, through all their changes and ups and downs and tensions, that they've managed to kind of keep to their original brief, where, whereas Fleetwood Mac changed radically from their original brief, but of course, to great success. 
and their evolution of the group has been a willingness to try different things, expanding from their base and adding new members. Part of that was born out of desperation. You know, the group's going to break up. How do we continue? And Nick Fleetwood, on several occasions, comes to the rescue. Well, we can put Buckingham and Nixon most famously, but also we can add Christy McVie. She's already married to John. She's already helping us out. Or I'm going to arrange for a house where we can really concentrate in the country on developing a new sound after Peter Green leaves. Or Bob Welch is a good guitarist. He's American, but, you know, it's not a big deal. We can have someone who's not British in the group. He's been willing to do whatever it takes to keep the group going. He has been the force behind getting Fleetwood Mac to continue and keeping some elements of their most recent lineup, but adding new ones. After a while, it became hard to recognize from their very original roots, but that was the continuity. That was the thread. They certainly don't need the money. (laughs) I guess they don't have anything else they can do. You know, I mean, that's been their life since the uh, middle 60s. And they're now like an institution. Now, as for the curse that is supposedly hanging over anyone tapped to pick up the axe for Fleetwood Mac, let me ask you, is it a curse to have an opportunity to create and perform music for a living, even for a short while? Is it a curse to entertain millions? Is it a curse to stay in expensive hotels, to be shuttled around in limousines? Were Peter Green, Jeremy Spencer, Danny Kerwin, Bob Welsh, Bob Weston, and Lindsey Buckingham cursed? Perhaps. More likely, the Brazilian novelist Paulo Coelho had it right. Every blessing ignored becomes a curse. Until next time. I'm Richard Serrett. So long for now. In their infinite wisdom, the pod guards have decided to end this hot mess now. The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone is researched, written, and hosted by Richard Serrett. Produced by David Whalen. And I'm Jamie Watson. The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone with Richard Serrett. Heard exclusively on Westwood One and the Jericho Network. Listen next week. Oh, come. We won't. You are a mess. We will rip.